Our great God and Father, we thank you for uh, this time together to gather in prayer under the sound of your word, and we pray that we be all blessed by it, by our friendship in Christ, and also by the word of God that gives us true hope. Lord, we pray that we would cling and cleave to the gospel of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, Amen. amen. So last week we talked about work and reforming work and how the Reformation had a big part in restoring a biblical theology and doctrine of work. I'd like to do the same thing, if you noticed in my prayer, praying about hope and how we have hope in Christ and what that means, talking about the kind of hope that comes in the faith that we profess as Christians. And so, talking about hope in a twofold way, I want to talk first about how we have hope in this life, and then also, according to Scripture, hope in the life to come. So, hope in this life, meaning from birth to death, from the time you've come to know Christ until He takes you home to be with Him, hope that the Reformation brought to those in Christ on this side of eternity is the hope that comes when the Bible is put back into the hands of the laity or of all Christians. When the Bible is put back into the possession, into the hands of ordinary men, women, and children. Part of what um, happened in the Reformation is that men and women could once again read the Bible in their own language and hear the Bible in their own tongue. For instance, one of the things that is almost unique to what a Protestant worship service, a traditional Protestant worship service has, is the confession of sin, now that's not unique, but what happens after it, the assurance of pardon or the preaching of the gospel, the promises of God proclaimed, that is unique to a Protestant worship service. And to hear that after you confess your sins is the whole, is the whole pie, is the whole picture, is to not only confess your sins and come before God acknowledging, I'm a sinner, I'm miserable, but in following that, directly after, to hear the comforting words of the gospel is something that was restored during the Reformation. And to hear it in your own language, to hear it in your own tongue. So if you were to go to a worship service 500 years ago, 600 years ago, prior to the Reformation, everything would be in Latin. And they would talk about the forgiveness that God gives. They would talk about the sacrifice of Christ, but it would be in Latin. And for the most part, people were not speaking and understanding Latin. And so while a worship service, say 600 years ago, you could, the, the gospel was presented in some form or fashion, it was not really grasped by most people. And so something that uh, in the Reformation was restored to the worship of God through His people is hearing the gospel in the language of the people gathered to worship, whether that be people in Germany or France or anywhere, hearing it in their native tongue. And not hearing the comforting words of pleading the merits of the saints or of your own contrition or as if you were to look at a service 600 years ago talking about the merits of Mary or of John the Baptist or the apostles, but hearing about the power of Jesus Christ, hearing about the hope that's in Jesus Christ, and not just the mere, may God have mercy on you, but hearing and seeing and reading a word of assurance that all who have truly confessed, all who have repented of their sins, desiring to forsake them, the Lord has promised in His holy word to forgive and to take away your sin as far as the east is from the west. That's something that was recovered and restored in the worship through the Protestant Reformation. Not hearing it in Latin, not hearing it as a potential, may God save you, may God have mercy on you, but a proclamation of pardon, a proclamation of assurance. This is unique and something that was brought into the hope of the worship of God's people to the triune God through the work of the reformers. And so in most traditional Protestant liturgies, the assurance of pardon after the confession of sin 
through the spoken word of a representative Christ, not telling them to go on pilgrimages to see relics or buy indulgences, but the hope in this life is that Jesus Christ is sufficient and is able to completely forgive you of your sins. And so something we can ask ourselves and ask each other as biblical, Bible-based Christians is, are you trusting in Christ alone for your salvation? Are you trusting in Christ alone? That's the heart of the matter as we talk about the theology and the work of the reformers and the heritage we have, is all of our hope in this life can be summed up in one man, one name, one person, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the hope that's been restored is that we have a Bible in our own language. And think about this. If we're being honest, we have a Bible in our own language. We probably have many copies of it. And even if you read it every day, even if you read it every week, whatever it might be, if we're being honest, we know that we still have a lot to learn. We still have a lot to live out. Even if you're reading the Bible every day, right? You still have a lot to learn and a lot to live out in terms of practically applying that word as a doer. Now imagine if your experience and relationship with the Bible was something that you maybe saw in person once a year. You saw a Bible maybe once a year, or you saw it every week, but it was chained to the church and you saw it from a distance. And if you got close, behold, it was in Latin. And let's say you didn't have the knowledge of the Latin language. So something that the reformers decided to do was everything in life takes practice. Everything in life takes a lot of learning, whether you're learning to shoot a gun or you're learning to build something or you're learning to be a man or be a woman. You, it's, something, it's a daily type of thing. If you're going to be a marksman, if you're going to be a carpenter, if you're going to be a mother, whatever it is, it takes a lot of practice. How much more the mysteries and the Word of God? It can't be something that you're exposed to once a year. It can't be something that you're exposed to from a distance. You need it in your hands. You need it proclaimed in your own language so that the hope of Jesus Christ would permeate, would go to everybody. So hear this order of logic and see, see what I'm saying here with the hope restored to us in this life through the word of God. Since God made you, he knows how to heal you. And the way that he has decided to heal us in large part is by his word and by his spirit. Since God made you, he knows how to heal you. He said, I'm going to heal you through my word and by my spirit. And the word of God made you, Jesus Christ. And that same word of God is also the way of knowing how to fully live, how to rightly live. And so the call on a Christian is to get into your Bible, learn, learn about God, learn about yourself. Scripture is the word of God. Jesus is the word of God made flesh. And so right there on its face, the best guide the truest foundation is Scripture. It is the guide to all of life, and in the flesh is the Lord Jesus Christ. And every Christian, all those that are baptized in a Christ that profess faith in His name and His power, have work to do for the kingdom of God. And the Word of God not only tells us how to live, but tells us how to do every good endeavor for the kingdom. I think Moses said it. he had to go to the bathroom. It's okay. And the Word of God informs all of life. So there's no little, last week, there's no little people, no little work to be done, no little churches. Jesus is with them and for them. The Word of God instructs us in how we ought to be. Therefore, to be bereft of the Word of God would negatively affect all of life. Not just your spiritual life, but your work life, your family life, your church life. If, if I don't have a, the scripture, it's like uh, lacking a map, lacking a compass, lacking the very heart within a body. It's not going to work. And so for that reason, the reformers, one of their, their greatest accomplishments was bringing the Bible into the language of the people. And through then also God using the printing press, bringing that um, multiplied and multiplied to go into the hands of people without an exorbitant cost. So it wasn't copied by hand any longer, but done through a printing press. It greatly reduced the cost of that. And so God worked not only 
spiritually through people, but in the events of invention and of creation, not only was the Word of God translated, but it could be brought into the homes and the hands of ordinary people without, you know, costing a fortune. And so, part of what the hope we have in this life is that we aren't left without a guide. We aren't left without a word um, of revelation that clearly tells us, here's what we ought to do. We aren't left confused or ignorant. But what does Scripture say in First, uh, excuse me, 2 Timothy 3.16? All Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. If I'm going to do any good work, let alone every good work, I need the Scripture. I need to know how to do it, why to do it. All Scripture is to train us for that purpose. And so the hope we have in this life is that God has spoken clearly, God has communicated, and it ought to be something you can access and understand through the church. All right, number two, reforming hope in the life to come. Jesus said in John chapter 6, talking about his people, hear these four words, I shall lose nothing. I shall lose nothing. Jesus said that about his people in John chapter 6. Take that in, think about it, and never forget it. Jesus said, I shall lose nothing. What the reformers were up against was the basically near dogma that you can never be certain of your salvation. You can never be certain that you are one of God's people. But what does 1 Peter chapter 1 say? One of the doctrines the reformers were up against is basically the dogma, you can't know if you're saved, you can't know if you're God's people. But look at what this scripture says, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So Peter opens up this letter by saying, praise be to God, you have been born again by faith in Christ, and that salvation is guarded by the Spirit kept in heaven for you. Does it sound like he wants you to be uncertain of your relationship with God? But what the, what the reformers were battling against is this idea of do your best and God's grace will take care of the rest. That was a, a basic summary of the dogma they were fighting. Do your best, God's grace will cover the rest. And so Christianity in the reformers' day or Luther's day, it, it had not forgotten that God was a God of grace. Don't get me wrong. They still talked about God's grace. They still talked about God's forgiveness but essentially the teaching was this. God will give you grace to make up where you fall short. God's grace is still something you have to use to gain acceptance. God does have grace, but that grace is to help you merit or win salvation so that on the final day, the, the day of judgment, you would stand and be accepted. And so God's grace was not sufficient to save. God's grace was something that would help you in your life and in your work to be made acceptable. Do your best and God's grace will cover the rest. Now, that message sounds close. That message sounds logical. But it's not what the Scripture teaches. Because if we have any hope, it's got to be that God's grace is sufficient to save, not only able to save, but actually sufficient to save someone who has sinned against God's law. And so in perfect contrast to that dogma, one of the, 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 the wonderful things the Reformation recovered was that the gospel not only offers grace, but the gospel supplies sufficient grace 
to save us. Because man has fallen, man is, is, is totally depraved, not just kind of sick, but dead in trespasses and sin, Ephesians chapter 1 and 2. And so in contrast to do your best and God's grace will, will, will do the rest, rather than looking to yourself, the Reformation recovered this truth, look to Christ and be saved. Jesus is the unshakable foundation. Jesus, His work, His cross, His power, that will be what helps you stand on the final day. And so not only hope in this life to know who God is and a communication from God, but hope in the life to come that when I stand before God, He will be someone I've already known, I've already been reconciled with, not through what I've done, but through the work of Jesus Christ. In fact, this is something that's not only taught in the New Testament through Christ, but is, is fully found in the Old Testament. For example, Psalm 73, 24, You will keep on guiding me all of my life with your wisdom and counsel, and afterwards you will receive me into the glories of heaven. Go back to John 6. Jesus says, I shall lose no one or I shall lose nothing. Talking about his people. Psalm 73 said, Lord, you're guiding me with your wisdom in this life. And afterwards, you will receive me into the glory of heaven. And Jesus goes on in John 17. Before he enters into his passion as he's praying in John chapter 17. Jesus says about his people, about his disciples, that they are in his hand and that he is in the Father's hand. And so what does that tell you? All of God's people, all of the saints, are in the hand of Christ. And Christ himself is in the hand of the Father. And he had already said in John 6, I will lose no one. All that the Father has given me will be saved. And Christ, who is our shepherd, the good shepherd, will lose not one of us. In in Genesis chapter 3, The prophecy about the salvation that would come through the seed of the woman is that he would have his heel bruised, but through his work he would crush the head of the serpent. And so if we are in Christ, in this life, your heel may be bruised. Jesus doesn't remove us from the world. He doesn't take us out of the world. In fact, John 17, Jesus says, I don't pray that you take them out of the world but that you would keep them and protect them. Jesus prays to the Father. So as Jesus had his heel bruised, but he crushed the head of the serpent, the evil one, so too as as a member of the body of Christ, through the trials of this life, your heel will be bruised. You're not going to be protected from every um, danger and every trial, but you will crush Satan under your feet. You will be an overcomer, a victor in the Lord. And if you're in Christ, you will not be lost. Jesus retains all of his sheep. You may be in the midst of the fire, like Daniel and his friends, but the Lord will be there with you. He will not lose us, but the scripture teaches again and again, he keeps us and he entrusts us to the perfect care of God the Father. John Calvin makes the point that just as in in nature, the clouds can disguise and hide the sun, but that doesn't make the sun go away. You know, if it's a cloudy day, you might not see the sun. It might feel really gloomy. So so too, it's true spiritually. Whether it's temptation or trials or just the fallenness of this world, it can make it seem as though the love and the graciousness of God is clouded or disguised, but it doesn't go away. Just in the way that a cloud can't make the sun go away, so too God's love, God's power, the the provision of Christ that you're in His hand and He is in the hand of the Father, that's always true. On our good days, on our bad days, through everything, this is the love of Christ. Trial and temptation can be like clouds. They can weaken our vision of God, but they can never destroy the love of God to keep and to guard you, that salvation that's kept in heaven for you. But rather, in number six, the Lord continues to keep and bless you. The Lord continues to shine His face upon you for all that are in Christ. And then we could multiply examples. Romans chapter 8, neither life nor death, nor principalities, nor powers, nor angels, nor height nor depth, nor anything in all the creation 
shall be able to separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Now, people will bring up Hebrews chapter 6, for example. Hebrews chapter 6 is, a, is the passage that talks a lot about warnings about not to continue in sin, not to go back to um, your old life, or the sacrifice of Christ, the atonement of Christ, will be of no sufficiency to you. Now, people will take Hebrews 6 and they'll say, therefore, look, you can lose your salvation, you can be in Christ and then jump out of Christ because of sin or because of whatever it might be. Now, that's a great point, but think of this. The context of Hebrews and Hebrews chapter 6, the temptation that the author is telling the readers, telling the believers to avoid, was the temptation to go back to the temple and to return to the ordinances and the sacrifices of the Old Covenant. That was what Hebrews is about, that there were Jewish Christians especially tempted to return to the temple because at the temple was the market, the family, the heritage, and at the church was persecution, poverty, and danger. And so why not just go back to the temple and resume the sacrifices as our forefathers have for 4,000 years? And the, the whole book of Hebrews is about the supremacy of Christ over the sacrifices, over angels, and over the priesthood of Aaron's line. That's what the whole book is about. So, for one thing, God has completely removed the possibility of that temptation, literally, because there is no temple in Jerusalem. It was destroyed in 70 A.D., never been rebuilt. They tried to rebuild it 400 years later, and when they did, I can't remember what happened, either fire fell from the sky or the ground opened. You can read about it. 400 years after Christ, they tried to rebuild the temple. Jewish people tried to rebuild the temple, and the ground literally swallowed people. Um, there was a, 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 an emperor who came to power who was against the Christians, and so he wanted to kind of slam it on the Christians by reopening the temple in Jerusalem. And the first day of building... Um, I can't remember, the ground opened or fire came out of heaven and they, they stopped, they immediately stopped. So the temptation that was being talked about in Hebrews 6, leaving the church to go back to the temple in Jerusalem, is no longer possible. There is no temple. Not to say there's not application for Hebrews chapter 6. There is. But the application is not, well, if you sin, then you lose your salvation. The application is a warning that in Christ is the fullness of life. In Christ is the fullness of salvation. Therefore, do not seek out anyone or anything to replace Christ. That's the application. So Hebrews 6 is not about losing your salvation. Hebrews 6 is not about the conditional love of God. That's absolutely not what it's about. It's about not rejecting Jesus for another option. It's about always keeping in mind the love and the grace of Christ. And so Hebrews 6 or any other passage, not about losing your salvation when we generally sin, but it's about remaining focused on the love and the perfection of Christ. Now there are those numbered in the church who fall away, 1 John chapter 2, but the scripture says they went out from us because they were not of us. If they had been of us, they would have continued with us but that it might be clear that they were not of us, they went out from us. First John 2, 19. And let's be frank, if we could lose our salvation, he would, many times over. But God is faithful. We saw that in 2 Timothy 2. God is faithful, he cannot deny himself. Even when we are faithless, God remains faithful still. And the next verse says, and let those who belong to the Lord cleanse themselves from all sin. Let those that do belong to the Lord not be complacent, not be lazy, not, not abuse grace, but let us cleanse ourselves to be a pure instrument in God's hands. And so, why uh, the Reformation matters in part is that hope matters. Faith, hope, and love, these three, but one remains as love. Well, one of those is hope. And bringing the Scripture into the hands of the people brings hope in this life. And reminding them of the assurance of God's love to keep them and to guard them brings hope for the life to come. That when I stand before the Lord, it'll be a good and wonderful day because of the merits of Jesus Christ and because of the love of Jesus Christ that keeps me in the faith. Questions? Comments? Comments?
Uriah. What is the glory of God? That's a great question. It's hard to answer, honestly. The glory of God is the wonderful, amazing, unexplainable perfection of God. The word glory means heavy or weight. And so the, the glory of God is that He is totally, I want to say glorious, <laughs> but heavy. His weight, meaning He is beyond us. He's wonderful. And so the glory of God is everything that makes God who He is and perfect. And so to do something for the glory of God is doing something for God, not because he needs us, but because we want to bless him and thank him for what he has done for us. Amelia? Do you have a question or do you want to ask a question? Okay. Does anyone have a comment or anything? Um, as Amelia thinks. Yeah, like a like a wish yeah, almost, a wish, but that's right. definitely yeah, that's less the, than the Bible. Intended, then, I'm sure. um, well, is, it's interesting. It's, really good, it's, good. it's interesting you bring that up because that kind of hope, the wish, is what the reformers were fighting against. Yeah. That if I do enough, yeah. God will cover me. Yeah. That's a wish. That's like a a good feeling. Yeah. But the hope of the the, the the Reformation recovered was faith in the unseen that God is able to save me completely without, without me. Yeah. I think of uh, the word, to me, how the word, uh, it is finished, doesn't line up with our definition of hope. Yeah. That, that, that God does all the work and you do not. You know, the, that the gospel is God centered and not man centered is hard to find in, 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 in and around this area and in much of the country. Uh, I have a comment on that, but Amelia, you go first before we move on. question. Jesus died on the cross to save us from our sin. Well, that, what that means is rather than we pay the price, Jesus paid it for us by laying down his life for us. Imagine, so Jesus calls himself a shepherd. A shepherd is someone, what is a shepherd? Who does the shepherd watch after? The good shepherd. He watches the sheep, make sure the sheep are okay. So imagine you had a bunch of sheep and a wolf came in to attack the sheep. A good shepherd fights the wolf so that the sheep don't get hurt. But the shepherd, he might get hurt while he's fighting the wolf because a wolf wants to eat the sheep. 
So when we say Jesus is the good shepherd who died for us, it means he fought the wolf to protect us, the sheep. But he, he didn't do that by fighting a wolf. He did that by dying on a cross and to save us, to protect us, to bring us to heaven. All right, now to go back to Neil, your comment. When you study the reformers, they, uh, the obvious dilemma was their controversy with Rome, okay? But down the road, there was the Radical Reformation, which was the Anabaptists, the Mennonites and the Amish, and, and eventually the, the Anabaptists and, and everything. And even as early as Luther, he was saying they both are doing the same thing, but in, in a different way. Luther was saying the, the, the Romanists are making salvation contingent or depend on the ceremonies, the sacraments, and the indulgences, tying it to the church. Salvation is tied to the church in, in, an, in an unbiblical way. Not saying the church is unimportant, but tying salvation itself to the church. He's saying that was the era of Rome. But the radical reformers, Re Reformation, the Anabaptists, the, um, the Mennonites, it, he, they were making the same error in that they tied salvation to experiences and to um, manifestations of the Holy Spirit. So you were saved if you spoke in tongues. You were saved if you had a, a, an experience that made you tremble or shake or fall to the ground. They were tying salvation to individual experience, even like as early as um, in Luther's day, not, not down the road, not like talking about people today, but the, the uh, Anabaptists of that day. And so Rome and the Anabaptists were, were anchoring salvation somewhere other than Christ. Now, totally different ends of the spectrum, but the Reformers were saying, they, but they both are making a similar error. So when you talk about a, a presentation of the gospel, um, a proclamation of the gospel, that really is true to the scripture, it anchors hope in Christ, the person. Now, does, does, does Christ bring us to the church? Yes. And does the Spirit of Christ uh, produce in us experiences and works of the Spirit? Yes. But salvation or justification can't be tied to these things because that's not what the scripture says. We're justified by faith in Christ who reconciles us to the church, who gives us a family, amen, that's part of sanctification, and who gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit, who will produce in us spiritual gifts. But salvation itself, if, it, if it's contingent on these things, then your hope is something that is fallible and experiential. And, and that's where you get the lack of assurance and the confusion. And so even though they, the Anabaptists were totally different than Rome. You know, they, they were meeting in, in houses. You know, no gold, no opulence, no, um, no beautiful cathedrals. It looked, it looked totally different. They were making essentially the same error in that they, they placed salvation in the hands of people instead of Christ. And so, that was something going on as early as 500 years ago, and, and yes, continues in Protestant churches today, for sure. You look like you're, you're chewing on a lot, Dad. makes the point, and that is irresistible grace. Hmm. He has his people. He won't lose one of them. Yeah. And that's, that's uh, you know, that's not something you kick the door open and say, but uh, my, my point is, that embraces the embodiment of this is the work of Christ and the Holy Spirit complete. The, the complete simple part is Living is the difficult part, and that's what we're 
Yeah. Irresistible grace. He'll have his people. And this is the, the scripture I kept quoting. I'll read it in, in total. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life, and I will raise Him up on the last day. So, there are two, um, two connections there that Jesus talks about. The will of the Father and believing, and then the will of the Father, and then those who come to Christ, the belief in Him. And He says these two things are the same. The will of the Father bringing men and women to Christ and their belief in Christ. These are hand in hand. And then the Lord's part, He's going to raise those people up on the last day. And He can do that because He has lost none of them. He has lost none of them. This is the will of the Father. This is the plan of Christ. And so, does my um, justification, is it contingent on a fallible church? No. Is it contingent on my experiences? Also, no. Is it contingent on Christ, who came by the will of the Father? Yes. So, that's hope, because now it's sturdy. Um, Psalm 26, Lord, you have put my feet on stable ground. That's the stable ground, is Christ. He, uh, Paul says, no one can build another foundation other than Christ Jesus. Now, are there prophets and apostles? Yes. Is there the house of God? Yes. Are there officers and ministers? Yes. And the whole family of God in heaven and on earth? Yes. But these things are secondary to the person of Jesus Christ. In Him, we have the revelation of God's peace and gospel and hope. And so, the, the message of Rome was very close and sounded close. And yet it led not to peace and hope, but to striving and to a total lack of assurance. And that was the, that was the bone to pick that the reformers um, stood up for again and again, is that Scripture alone is the infallible truth rule of faith, and that our justification before God is by faith in Christ. Anything else before we pray? Ask me later, okay? Remember, mom said one question each, okay? Remember your question. We'll talk about it after.